This film was made in 1946, when development work on the Tudor One advanced to the stage where the prototype was ready for preview by Boscombe Down, and the prototype Tudor Two was being prepared for flight. The film was made by Mr. Fred Pedley, and has not previously been shown. Okay, Hutch. In 1943, the first plans were made for the rebirth of civil aviation. Avros conceived the idea of using the Lincoln as a basis for a transatlantic pressurized airline. Their military specification was issued in March 1944 on this basis. But by the time detailed design had commenced, a completely new fuselage had evolved on the aircraft designated Avro Type 688 Tudor. Two prototypes were ordered in September 1944. The first of these, GAGPF, making its initial flight from Ringway in June 1945. This film shows the prototype aircraft. A feature of the aircraft is the flight engineer station. This was the first time such a station had been used on a British SIL aircraft. The pilot was Bill Thorne, who was then Abbott's chief test pilot. This film was taken on the day the aircraft departed for Boscombe Down for its first trials. You can notice that the aircraft still had early configuration of fin and rudder. Difficulties with lateral stability subsequently led to a major modification of the fin. The aircraft was powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlins of 1,760 horsepower each. Fourteen production Tudor ones were ordered for British Overseas Airways Corporation, and subsequently an order was received for six for British South American Airways. The aircraft configured to carry 28 passengers in some considerable luxury. The passenger on the left was Arthur Bowers, the flight engineer on the Tudor. He was subsequently asked to act as a steward to show how the bunks could be made up to allow passengers to have sleeping accommodation on a transatlantic flight. Our final shots show the Tudor One flying circuits round the old buildings of Minway prior to departing for Boscombe. The approach and landing, made by a Boston Down pilot, show clearly the split flaps on the aircraft, but illustrates perhaps not the best way to land an aircraft. In addition to working on Tudor 1, Roy Chadwick and his team were also working on Tudor 2 to meet a British Overseas Airways requirement for a 60-seat airliner to operate over shorter ranges. Roy Chadwick is in the centre of the group. On his left is Bill Willis, the project designer, and on his right, Jack Scott, a section leader draftsman, and Jimmy Turner, the chief draftsman. Also in the group are Bob Lindley from the initial project section, George Beardsall, system systems engineer, Henry Bennett, chief draftsman, and Donald Wood from the performance section. Construction work on the production Tudor One aircraft was proceeding fast. These show, shots show the aircraft being assembled on the track at Woodford. See the rear pressure bulkhead on this production fuel line. Also on the track at Wood at this time were Lancastrians. These were the last of this type to be produced and were destined for British South American Airways. These are further shots of the Tudor. On the 10th of March 1946, the prototype Tudor 2 was rolled out. Many Avro personalities were present on this occasion to watch the first flight. 
you can see the back view of Eddie Fielding. And there is a Roy Dobson watching the aircraft leave the hangar. In a moment you will see briefly the head of Jimmy Kay, who was later become general manager of Avros. Sir Roy is seen here talking to Bill Thorne, chief test pilot, who together with Jimmy Orrell, second pilot and Arthur Bowers, flight engineer, go inside the aircraft for the first flight. There was a press review where about 20 newsreel and press photographers were invited and were given a York with all the starboard set windows taken out so that some particularly good air to air shots were taken on that day which was rather dull for flying. Here you see a group of 60 people assembled to give an idea of the cabin capacity. They were of course not allowed to fly on the main flight. Good for you at takeoff. Later on, he does another pass. This was after lunch, when one of the press photographers said to Bill Thorne that he didn't keep it low enough at the end of the runway for him to get some good pictures. This was just the wrong thing to say to Bill Thorne, who made a pass that almost parted their hair at the end of the runway. One man in particular was filming for British Movie Tone standing on top of a shooting break with an elevated platform as well. Bill Thorne missed him by no more than three feet. It was quite deliberate and was to be expected from Bill Thorne having been given such a challenge at lunchtime. see the nacelle of the York just appearing at the top left hand corner of the picture. The York was a particularly good airplane to film from, and of course a high wing made almost unrestricted views on that side. But of course on the day of the main flight with 20 odd press photographers all competing with very sharp elbows for the best windows, one had to have equally sharp elbows to get any shots at all. you see Tudor 1 and Tudor 2 flying together. A quick shot across the aerodrome at Woodford, part of Bram Hall, wheels come down landing. As the aircraft taxied in at Woodford, many Arab personalities were waiting on the tarmac to beat the flight crew. Bill Thorne Jimmy Orrell and Arthur Bowers are greeted first of all by Sir Roy. Roy Shatwick is on his right, Teddy Fielding, now president of the Manchester branch, on his left, together with Al Seward and Jimmy Kay. Henry Ford said, history is bunk. We didn't quite hear what Sir Roy said, but we can guess. <laughs> 